Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to come before you for this another Sunday. We pray you would be in the midst and that you would meet us where we are right now, whether we're in this building physically, whether we're in our homes, whether we're in our cars, whether we're at a retreat, you know, whatever we're doing, we just pray you would meet us where we are. We thank you for your technology that makes it possible. And right now, we just pray you would get the glory out of all that we do today and um, draw us closer to you and use this as a time for us to focus on you and become more like you build us up and, and make us better disciples for whatever it is that you have for us we just pray that this moment though will truly be about you and that you would meet us here in this place these things we ask in your son jesus name amen good morning everybody and welcome to our service today um this is yes this is the um well, we are in July, toward the end of July at this point, and it's still like amazing to me that this month is going by as quickly as it is. It's amazing to me this year is going by as quickly as it is, but I am very thankful to be here with all of you today. Um, it's good to see those of you in the comments. Hi, Mom, Rhonda. Hi, Sylvia. Um, and yeah, we are just thankful, and I say we because even though you only see me, Obviously, First Lady and Baby Boy are never too far away. So um, I'm just thankful, though, to be here. I'm thankful to be here before you. And the reason I had to grab my phone is that I apparently, um, which I'll get to that, but I shared today's service already, but I didn't actually close it on my phone. So I was hearing my voice echoing back at me. You all couldn't hear it. But it is good to be here. Um, I'm glad to see all of you. I'm glad to have this chance to spend time with you today um and so for those this is your first time with us you know we welcome you to pivot point gathering a church that's dedicated to breaking barriers and building bridges and we encourage you to fill out a contact card i'm looking for the link right now but the link uh, this link is also available in the description of today's message so just make sure you do it at some point that way we can be in touch with you and figure out how we can better serve you and what it is that you need. But we're glad that you're here, whether this is your first time here or you've been here several times. You know, as we're also accustomed to do, I want to make sure people know how to find us on social media because, you know, that is how we spread the word about things we're doing. So if you're watching us live right now, you know you can find us on Facebook at Pivot Point Gathering. We're also on YouTube if you search Pivot Point Gathering. And we're on Instagram. Twitter, although like I've said, we don't really use Twitter too much. You know, a lot of people are migrating away from Twitter as a result of the Elon Musk takeover, but also TikTok. We're on all three of those as underscore pivot underscore point. We will be starting a Threads account pretty soon, though. Those of you who know anything about Instagram Threads know that it's essentially an extension of your existing Instagram account. So if you already follow us on Instagram, when we start the underscore pivot underscore point account on Threads, you'll be following us there as well. But for those of you who are following us or subscribing to us or liking us, whatever the terminology is on any of the social media platforms, we're thankful for that. You know, the way the algorithm rhythm works, the more people follow us and the more people who are engaged with our content, the further it is pushed. And I'll say on TikTok, on Instagram, and on YouTube, um, we release some small form videos every week, you know, little clips from our sermons. and. They are getting a lot of attention because of you all. So thank you for that. And also, if you'd like some more information about what we do, um, visit us at our website, pivotpoint.church. And hi, I see I see you, Sister Michiko. I see you, Sister Victoria and Evangelist Tyra. It's good to see you as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to... Um, oh, one last thing. I always encourage people to share our services because that's how people find out that we exist, you know, being online, being on, whether we're on Facebook or anywhere else, is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But if you have benefited a lot from this proverbial needle in a haystack and want your friends and family to know about us, we encourage you to share. Sharing is like word of mouth. And a lot of things that we've been doing, we've been able to do 
you know, people have found out about us because of your shares. So we want to thank you for that and encourage you to do the same. I've already shared. As I said, I had a little mishap with my phone today, but I've already shared. And if you feel led to share, great. If not, it's okay. We love you and we're glad that you're here. Um, so yeah, I'll talk some more when we get to my the usual, usual section about remarks, but you know, we want to still be in prayer as we see Sister Victoria here today, but there are um, a lot of women who went to Star Pope's retreat who will be traveling this morning, so we want to keep them in prayer um, and just pray that it also was a good time of fellowship and that they drew closer to you in the process, closer to God, that means. Yeah, but anyway, I'm just thankful to see you all. So what I'm going to do is I am going to jump into our song for today. Um, and our song for today is one that I like a lot, though I'm not sure if I sang it recently, but it's Falling in Love with Jesus, and it's just a reminder that, um, you know, we do feel protected in God's arms no matter what is happening around us. But yeah, I'm glad to be here with you all, and this is another song that I'm looking forward to us singing together when we get a chance to. And I see, oh, good morning, so... Um, Deaconess Julia, my, my mom is here. So it makes sense because we meet by, um, you know, we're virtual. So people are able to catch up with us, you know, wherever they are. And I'm thankful for that. So um, with that, though, we are going to jump into our um, song. Oh, but before we do that, I will say, I'm going to say this a few different times. Happy birthday to Uncle William. Uncle William is usually always watching. And I see... Oh, Vicky and Uncle William are watching. So that means that they're back from the retreat already. So I want to shout out Uncle William. Um, the comment was a little long, but today is his birthday. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind us saying he is 81 years old. He would never know it. In fact, you know, I can say this. I know Uncle William is watching now. I was outside trying to tackle the weeds that had grown up in front in my front yard. And one of my neighbors said, oh, where's your gardener? I said, oh, you mean my uncle? Yeah, you know. So, like, you know, everybody knows Uncle William in my community. And I'm like, yeah, you know, he's retired and he just does it for fun. And, you know, I don't want to put any pressure on him because it's been hot. <laughs> you know, he, he's still going through medical treatments. But, yeah, Uncle William, we love you. And we are thankful that God has allowed you to stay with us longer. Um, you know, like, you've been a great influence on all of us. I know I talk about you all the time on Father's Day, but you really have been an example of what a man should be and how a man should take care of his family. And I'm thankful to have had you as an influence in that way. And I'm thankful that you're here to hear me say that. So thanks, Uncle William. And then I see more happy birthdays coming through to Uncle William. There's one from my mom. <laughs> there's one from my mother-in-law. And there's one from Cousin Sylvia. Yeah, and Uncle William, so Sawyer and I will be by to visit a little later after after service is over, all right? So uh, with that, I'm going to jump into our song for today, all right?
best thing I ever, ever done. In his arms, I feel protected. In his arms, never disconnected. In his arms. Okay, and I am back and I see the comments that my mother is still on the road, but Victoria is back. So that's how Uncle William is able to watch. So, hi, hey, Mom, you know, safe travels. And I'm just glad that you all are still able to participate in our service today. You know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But um, now that we're back, um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, so... One big thing I want to say, you know, last week, the whole thing with um, Carly Russell, for those who don't know, that was the woman in Alabama who, um, well, this time last week, we thought that she had been kidnapped by um, human traffickers. It's now looking more and more like the story is a hoax. But I just want to encourage us to continue to be in prayer for her and for her family um, because... You know, regardless of what happened, there are going to be some major, you know, impacts of this. If it turns out this was a kidnapping that just can't be corroborated, that's going to be traumatic for her and her family not to be believed. If it turns out that this was some kind of elaborate hoax on her part, you still have to think about all the trauma that her family would go through for believing that she had been kidnapped, not to mention, you know, what kind of mental state she would have had to be in to do such a thing. So... I just want to encourage us to continue to be in prayer about that already. I mean, continue to be in prayer about that in general. And also just think about the fact that, yes, even if this story may not have, you know, panned out the way we thought it would, 
there are, you know, black and indigenous women that go missing every day that don't get a lot of media attention because of the fact that, you know, in general, our society just doesn't pay a lot of attention to what happens to especially women of color. So let's just continue to be in prayer for those families who are impacted by, you know, human trafficking, those families whose loved ones are missing, those families who've been able to, who've been unable to get the level of media attention necessary um, to, you know, bring their loved one home. I don't want anybody to um, look at the case of Carly Russell and think now whenever they see claims about a black woman being missing that she's not. And that would not happen, you know, with many other races. So let's just continue to keep that in prayer, all right? Uh, also, let's see. I just want to make an announcement that we are, when I say we, I mean me and First Lady and Baby Boy and also Mom Rhonda, we will be traveling. So as a result, next week's service will be pre-recorded. But don't worry, you know, we will have something for you just in case you are wondering but you know pray for our traveling mercies we will be flying it's going to be Sawyer's first flight so any of you who've ever flown with well by then he'll be a 17 month year old just um, 17 month old just pray for us because you know babies can be unpredictable and this baby especially <laughs> has a strong personality so be in prayer for us but we're looking forward to some good time of rest and relaxation um yeah away from home for a bit but don't worry uh, there will be a service that will be available this time next week so i'm just going to be pre-recording it beforehand and you know maybe you'll see me in the comment section all right so with that we are going to move into what we are praying for all right so in general these are the same things we pray for every week um, we're praying about our location, not just the type of building we should have, you know, because we do want to be able to make a difference wherever we are. And that requires a particular kind of facility, you know, but we also are praying about where it should be in general. What community? Because whatever community God sends us to is going to be a community where he wants us to be engaged and make a difference. Um, and we also just want a location in general because we know that there are people who whether it's because they're on the other side of the digital divide, whether it's because they just don't like social media, whether it's because they're uncomfortable with technology in general, there are people that we are unable to reach with our purely digital footprint right now. And so we want to be able to reach those people. So be in prayer with us as we look forward to our location. Um, also be in prayer with us as we pray for the capacity, meaning our ability to do what God has called us to do. You know, God has given us a big vision. God has given us an amazing tagline. I feel that God has given us a great mandate. And in order for us to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, we need the resources to make it happen. We need the people to make it happen. We need the focus to make it happen. So when I talk about those things, I'm talking about tools as well. That's what I mean by capacity. We also want to continue to pray about the violence that's happening in our streets. You know, it seems like there's like, a mass shooting happening every week. And that's just like, even in this general area, you know, like there was this past week, there was a shooting in Feltonville that occurred while people were gathered to, um, at a vigil for a shooting victim. So this gun violence is getting out of hand. And I do believe that we as Pivot Point Gathering have a role in helping to, you know, stop this, whether it's engaging politicians, whether it's joining in with our other churches in this area, meaning Northeast Philadelphia, where I'm from, for prayer rallies and prayer walks and things like that. I think there's a role for us. So just keep praying as we figure out what our role is. We also want to continue to pray for, about those in our community that are having health issues. You know, we are mostly black community and as such, you know, we are like I guess our experience shows you know that, that those health disparities are real that the health outcomes that we see in our communities versus others they really are lower and some of that has to do with lack of access and some of that also has to do with bias within the medical system so 
we want to pray for our members who are going through various things, members that have chronic illnesses, but we also want to have a role in ensuring equitable access, all right? Then we also want to pray about um, infrastructure. And again, it seems like every week we have a new reminder, you know, whether it's the fact that for those who may be in Phoenix or know people in the Phoenix area, um, be with all these high temperatures, um, people are actually getting burned by touching concrete. Like, no exaggeration. I read an article about this, about, like, kids having to go to the emergency room after stepping outside their homes barefoot or, like, senior citizens falling. And then now they have to be treated not just for the fall, but for the burn because they hit the concrete. Or, you know, especially homeless people and what's happening with them because a lot of times we forget, you know, we think about in this part of the country when it gets cold, um, at least homeless people on the West Coast will have to deal with that. But now these extreme temperatures, homeless people in um, places like Phoenix, you know, have to deal with the fact that they can overheat and that they can literally just burn by being outside too long. So we want to be in prayer about infrastructure because a lot of things in our country were not designed for the extreme heat that we're experiencing in some places and also the increase in rain that we're experiencing in others. And that is something, as we know, in this area, not that far from where I live, um, there was a flash flood um, that ended up taking out a car full of a family that was from South Carolina in town visiting. And just a few days ago, they were able to find the body of the two-year-old girl who was swept away. And again, it's a reminder, like, that's a road that I've been on several times. And you don't... You know, in this area, we have a lot of creeks. We don't really think about the fact that the small creeks are the ones that are more likely to flood out. You know, like I live right by a large creek not called Neshaminy Creek in this area. I don't think about that creek overrunning. You know, or, or should I say, I think about that creek overrunning, but the reality is the small tributaries that feed into that larger creek, the, the little tiny um, tributaries that we don't pay much attention to are the ones that are more likely to cause such a flood. So when I talk about infrastructure, I'm talking about making sure that our nation is able to respond to things like that. We also want to continue to be in prayer for our bereaved families and for our political system in general because it's just becoming worse and worse if we keep up with it. And that brings me back to... Um, now I'm back on screen for a little bit. So um, we do have some more announcements about things that are happening within our community. I'm going to jump, put the screen right back up. Reverend David, the good news is that um, his military training is almost over, and he's supposed to be coming back home at some point this week. Um, but if you'd still like to send him a care package or some well wishes, contact us. We'll make sure he gets them, and he's in good spirits. In fact, I appreciate the fact that even though he's been away, he's kind of been checking on me and making sure I'm okay. And, you know, it's amazing to have friends that will do that, so... We want to continue to keep him in prayer and thank God for his influence and for his role in this ministry. Also, our barbecue is happening August 26th. We are going to be in Core Creek Park, which if you were worshiping with us as Yorgo Christian Ministries, you know that is the same park we had to barbecue at for the past two years. We're going to be in Pavilion 8. So the same general area where we were last year, but a little further down the path with a better view of the lake and a better breeze. Um... We're going to start at about 12 o'clock. We'll have an official flyer on social media soon. I am working on it. And, you know, we will also, those of us who are in leadership, will be meeting to work out some logistics, well, presumably after we get back from our vacation. And lastly, we'll be starting a Bible study and a prayer line. The details will be announced, but, you know, it's something that you will probably want to be a part of. We're still working out how we're going to collect prayers, um, I heard something interesting from a colleague of mine in ministry about using a texting platform to do that. So, you know, we're still praying about what we're going to do, but we will have something for you soon. So keep that in prayer. And like, we really want to make sure that we're providing opportunities to build community in this place. All right. Because that's really what people are coming to church for is to worship and praise God, but also to be a part of a community. And we want to make sure we're providing opportunities for our community bonds to grow, even though we are a primarily um, 
virtual church right now. So uh, before we um, jump into our message for today, I just want to remind you all, if this is your first time with us, feel free to fill out a contact card. Um, again, the link is available in the description to today's message. And I also want to take the time out to say we are a church that believes in the power of prayer. So as you've seen, some people have probably been putting their prayer requests in the comments already. If you put your prayer requests in the comments while we are live on Facebook, we will pray for those prayer requests before service is out. So feel free to put those in now. Or if this is your first time and you are filling out a contact card, you can put your prayer request in the contact card too. All right. Um, you can also leave your prayer requests on um, our Facebook and Instagram stories. Those prayer requests will remain private, but we will pray for them after service. All right. Um, also, if you would like to make a donation to where we are, well, to what we are doing right here, here at Pivot Point Gathering, you can do so at this link above in the screen. Also, this link is located in your, um, it's also located in the description for today's message. So if you'd like to put it to, um, I am tongue tied. I'm going to say that once again. The link is also located in the description of today's message. So there's no pressure to write it down quickly. Just click on the link later if you feel led to give us a donation, whether it's a tithe or an offering. If you want to know where the money goes for this church, um, well, we did upgrade our equipment. You know, within the past few weeks, we've upgraded our cameras. Um, within the past year, we've also upgraded our keyboards. When you hear me singing on the keyboard, well, singing with the keyboard, that is a new keyboard that belongs to the church. We're going to be upgrading some more of our equipment soon. Um, but right now, most of the money is going toward actually saving so that we can look toward getting our building. That being said, we do um, also use the money to pay um, outside ministers when I'm on a break and also to do things in our community. Like most recently, um, we made a donation to the Maternity Care Coalition and we also did collect for some friends of ours who were involved in a fire. So if you want to know where your money is going, it's going to places like that and initiatives like that. All right. And lastly, um, if you'd like some more information about who we are, what we do, check us out at our website at pivotpoint.church. Now that we're done with that, I am going to move to um, our message for today. So if we can open our Bibles to, um, or in the case of most, of most of us really search in our Bibles for, John chapter 11, beginning at verse 32. That's John chapter 11, beginning at verse 32. And we'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, so feel free to type through amen when you get it. And for those of you who are Bible scholars and you're looking at this, you're like, because, you know, I have fun putting up pictures that represent the passage we're talking about. So you might be wondering, like, well, what does this picture represent? If any of you have any ideas, I'll give you a little bit of time, but... Some of you can probably figure this one out, but this is John chapter 11, beginning at verse 32. When you have it, type through amen. And if you were trying to figure out, again, this is a picture of a man, presumably Jesus in the middle, and there are two women, and they're looking in a tomb. One has her hands on her eyes like she's weeping, and the other one is looking. And thanks, Mom Rhonda, for putting through the amen. And if you all guessed that this was Jesus, Mary, and Martha, you are correct. Not that there's a lot of guessing you do. Your Bible probably could have told you that by now. But yes, that is what we are talking about today. So, and it reads thus. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came after her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So. The Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have, 
have opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man also from dying. So Jesus, again, became being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was laying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did not I say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth bound, hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Today, if we are taking notes, the title of today's message is this. It's okay to cry. That is, it's okay to cry. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you today. We thank you for just the love that exists in this place and the love that exists in this community. And we just pray right now as we come to this moment of preaching that you would use me for your glory. Just move me out of your way and use me as a vessel. Um, to speak directly to these, your people, such that they will hear, see, and experience everything directly from you. We just thank you for the privilege to come before you, and we pray that you will get the glory even now out of this moment. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. So, it's okay to cry. And I am repositioning things, but I, of course, still need to keep my iPad and my laptop nearby, because in case you haven't figured out, that laptop is wh where the graphics I put on screen come from. So, it's okay to cry. As I prayed about what I was going to preach on this morning, God brought me to this particular passage, and it's a familiar one for those of us who grew up in church. In fact, um, I remember growing up at Star of Hope Baptist. You know, I talk about Star of Hope all the time, but growing up there, when I went to Sunday school, um, we had this practice of reciting Bible verses. Like our teachers would tell us, go home, study, come back with a Bible verse that you didn't know last week, and then we'll share it at the end of class. And a lot of times we would have one big prayer circle where everybody who came to Sunday school will get a chance to go around and share the verse that they knew. And things would usually go pretty smoothly, especially for those of us who are a little bit older. But by the time we got to um, somebody who was younger or somebody who was, you know, maybe a little newer, um, they would typically freeze and smile. We'd be like, oh, they don't have a Bible verse. And one of the teachers would say, just say Jesus wept. Just say Jesus wept. And so they would say Jesus wept. And that was how I learned that Jesus wept was actually, you know, a Bible verse. Granted, I did not know where it was. And it took a long time for me to understand that, you know, Jesus wept was John eleven thirty five. And in fact, even in my adulthood, I came to understand that this verse was key to what became one of my favorite passages, which is the story of Mary and Martha and particularly the resurrection of Lazarus. And indeed, if you followed my ministry for a bit, you know that I really like talking about Mary and Martha. You know, and usually when I preach this passage, I focus a lot more on Mary or Martha or even Lazarus. But today we're talking a lot about Jesus and in particular why it was so important that he wept. Because there's a lot that we can learn from Jesus in this simple act of weeping in this one verse that is only two words, Jesus wept. And I feel this is important because we are in a society today where a lot of time is spent policing people's emotions. And it's true. Yet in this passage, passage Jesus was emotional in a public context. You know, he, who by this point we are clear is God in the flesh, cries about the death 
of his friend and the grief that it caused his friend's sisters, who also were his friends, Martha, and a little bit more notably in this passage, Mary, because Mary is the one whose weeping inspired Jesus to weep. But you see, our society has conditioned us to believe that in many circumstances, crying is not only a bad and distracting thing to do, but it's a waste of time. Yet crying, as we know, especially those of us who you know studied psychology and things like that, crying is one of the major ways that we are able to process difficult and painful emotions. But before we get into why Jesus wept, we're gonna give a little bit more context. So this story takes place in Bethany, which as scripture says, is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And it takes place pretty late in Jesus's ministry. In fact, if you read the book of John, you find that this is really occurring right as Jesus is making his final journey into Jerusalem. So this is right before Palm Sunday. And in terms of the chronology of Jesus's life, we know that if we are right around Palm Sunday, Jesus is going to be crucified in about a week at this point. All right. So that gives you an idea. We're very close to the end of his life. Um, but and at the beginning of this very chapter, you know, we see that Jesus finds out that Lazarus is sick. But even though he knows Lazarus is sick, he makes the decision to stay where he is for another two days. And in doing so, he says in verse four of the chapter, this sickness is not to end in death for the glory of God. So the son of man may be glorified by it. In other words, he is confident that Lazarus, this is not the end of Lazarus's story. So Jesus finally begins the journey to Bethany. And by the time he begins the journey to Bethany, he receives word that, well, actually he already is clear, even before he receives word of it, he's already clear that Lazarus has died. And indeed, by the time Jesus and his disciples get to Bethany, Lazarus has not only died, but he has been in the tomb for four days. And it's here that Martha enters the story. Now, for some background, we, have, we hear about Martha. We know that Martha had a house in Bethany and that this is a house where Jesus conducted a lot of his ministry when he was in the area. Because when we first hear about Mary and Martha, we hear about them, and I believe it's in the Gospel of Luke, but we hear about them where um, Jesus is confronted by Martha because Martha wants Mary to help her a little bit more in what she's doing. So that's when we hear about um, Mary and Martha. So this is the same Mary and Martha. By this point, we know that Martha is a little bit more brash and bold. And so when Martha hears that Jesus is in town, Martha doesn't wait for Jesus to get to her house. Martha goes and finds Jesus and confronts him. And she makes it clear to Jesus that she knows if Jesus had gotten there earlier, her brother would still be alive. And although Jesus tries to comfort her and say, well, you know, um, he still will, be, will arise. She's like, no, I, I mean, I know he's going to arise at some point, but like she misses the fact that Jesus is telling her that he's planning on resurrecting Lazarus. Eventually, Jesus then asked her, you know, if she believes that he can. And, you know, in general, he said, she says, yes, you know, she believes. But while this conversation is going on, um, somebody goes to tell Mary, you know, Martha's sister, that Jesus is in town and that Martha has confronted him. So, of course, Mary comes and passage lets us know that there also were a lot of Jews with her. And Mary, in her own way, confronts Jesus, too, saying, well, you know, if you had been here, my brother would be alive. But at the same time, she's weeping while she's doing it. And while she's weeping, there were a lot of others who were weeping with her, you know, supporting her through her mourning. But what we see in this is that Jesus begins to weep as well. And in, indeed, for those who need some more background, Mary's weeping in this passage is the subject of, you know, the Negro spiritual O Mary, you know, best known for a lot of us from its cover by Take Six, where you're like, oh, O Mary, don't you weep, tell Martha not to moan. You know, I'm not going to sing it right now because I'm a little hoarse, 
even though I just sang earlier, but <clears throat> you get the idea. So as I've said, Jesus, when he sees Mary and her weeping, he does request to be brought to Lazarus's tomb, but he also begins to cry. You know, as the verse says, Jesus wept. So now that we understand what was going on and what led to Jesus weeping, we can move on to our first point, which is the first thing we're going to discuss that we can learn from Jesus weeping. And that is relationships matter. Again, relationships matter. So what we find in this passage is that Jesus genuinely cared about Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Because sometimes we as people of faith minimize the importance of relationships. And I get it. As believers, God is first in our life. And besides, people can be flaky and disappointing in general. I mean, I know in my younger years, I was thoroughly convinced that I didn't really need people in my life because, you know, they generally let me down. And as I got older, I realized that that wasn't true. You know, we're created for that kind of fellowship. Because all that we're created to have fellowship with God, we are created to have fellowship with one another. And one way that Jesus modeled this for us was in how he dealt with the people in his life, how he handled his relationships. He was a devoted son who cared about his mother, Mary. We don't really know much about what happened, you know, with Joseph. Some scholars suggest that Joseph may have actually died by the time Jesus was an adult. But we know that Jesus nonetheless cared about his family. We even hear about Jesus and his brothers. Um, but Jesus, in addition to that, he was also a great friend and mentor to the 12 disciples, including Judas, the one who turned on him. And not just those close disciples, but even the ones that were a little further out, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Jesus was a good friend and a good mentor to them as well. So when Jesus wept, he wept in part because he was distraught over the death of his friend and the grief that his friends were experiencing. And this is important because we know that even before walking into Bethany, Jesus was clear that he was going to resurrect Lazarus. But what can we learn from this? While God does want to be the focus of our lives, our relationships with people still matter. And truth be told, some of us don't want to hear this because, as I've been saying for weeks, some of us like the idea of using our relationships with God to look down on others. But if anything, our relationship with God should show us how to show up better for the people God has placed in our lives. And again, I'll say this again. If anything, our relationship with God should help us to show up better for the people who God has placed in our lives. That means for me, my relationship with God should help me to be a better husband, a better father, a better son, a better friend, a better cousin, a better employee. And you get the picture. Whatever we do in our lives, whoever God has placed in our lives, our relationship with God should help us to show up better for those people that God has placed in our circle. Now, I do want to make this clear. Our relationships with others are important, but those relationships should not be leading us away from God. That's why I made it clear the people that God has placed in our lives are important. So I don't want you to walk away from here, this message, thinking that I said, you know, relationships with people are so important that we should just, you know, do our best in them no matter what. Like, no, that's not what I'm saying here. No relationship should bring us away from God. And if we are in a relationship with somebody, whether a friendship, a romantic relationship, a business partnership, whatever it is, if that person, the way that they live, the way they act, if they are pulling us away from God, we need to pull back. But what I am saying is that God did not design us to walk through life alone. We are meant to be in community. And that's one of the major reasons that the church exists. The church exists to bring praise and glory and honor to God, but the church also exists so that we as believers have a like-minded group that we can turn to for encouragement as we walk through this journey called life. I mean, the reality is that being a believer is not easy. 
There are things that we may want to do that we can't do. There are ways that we may, may want to react to people that we can't react. I mean, I always use this example that some of us, and I know I am in this um, category sometimes as well, some of us have got short tempers and would curse people out in a second. But like, you know, when you are a believer, you actually can't tell people off the way you want to. You know, and I'm pointing this out because a lot of times when people think about the things that we want to do that we can't do, people often think about what I like to say, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. All right, you get the idea. But sometimes it's just something as simple as, I really want to tell this person off because they're getting on my nerves. But I can't do that because I can tell God is working on this person and God is using me to bring this person closer to him. So even though I may be losing patience, I can't tell them off. I can't hit them. <laughs> I can't tell them to delete my phone number. You know, I can't do any of that. And some of you might be able to relate. As you can see, uh, the Holy Spirit has definitely worked on me with patience. If These are the examples I'm giving. And maybe some of you can relate to that. But in talking about this a bit more, at Pivot Point, we are trying hard to create more opportunities for us to come together and fellowship. Because as a church, that is a part of what we're supposed to be doing. And I know it can be a bit challenging for a virtual church, but we're working on it. Pray for us. And we thank you for your patience. So now this brings me on to my second point. The first point that we can learn from Jesus weeping is that our relationships matter. And the second point we can learn is that showing emotion doesn't make us any less powerful. Again, showing emotion doesn't make us any less powerful. Now, the fact that Jesus wept in this situation is pretty revolutionary. After all, Jesus was, you know, the son of God and God in the flesh, as we understand, which means he had all power in his hands. And by this point in scripture, seeing as this is toward the end of Jesus's earthly life, we know that Jesus had performed all sorts of miracles. Indeed, later in this passage, some of those who were watching said, well, couldn't Jesus have brought this man back to life if he were here sooner? You know, so people knew Jesus was capable of a lot. But nonetheless, when Jesus was faced by Mary's tears, he cried. And why would he do that? Well, I believe a part of the reason that Jesus wept was to show those around him, and by extension, us who read this gospel today, that showing emotion is not a demonstration of weakness. Again, showing emotion is not a demonstration of weakness. And why did I have to say that? Because for whatever reason, many of us today feel that our large displays of emotion, especially crying, are signs of some sort of deficit. For men in our society today, our crying is seen as unmanly. And I had to talk about this a little bit because not only did Jesus weep in this passage, but he wept for his friend Lazarus, who was also a man. And see, in our society today, Homophobia has gotten men to the point where we are afraid of showing any kind of emotion to each other. I mean, thankfully, I'm blessed to have, you know, a group of friends who, like I said, check in on each other and make sure we're okay and actually hug and shake hands when we leave. But a lot of men don't have that. And if you are, need an example, just think about the uproar of some of the photos of Michael B. Jordan and director Ryan Coogler that were taken while they were promoting Creed II. And yes, I have the picture in case you need to see it. Some of you don't remember this picture. You see, Michael B. Jordan has his hand on Ryan Coogler's head. And there was a pretty big uproar about this photo when it was first taken. Um, I'm going to put myself back up on the screen a little bit so that you can still see me and this. But there was a bit of uproar about this photo when it was taken you know, because people are uncomfortable with seeing men, especially black men, showing some sort of affection toward one another. Now, I look at this and see a group of friends, and we can understand that this was important because in, this, in their career, Michael B. Jordan um, was in um, Fruitvale Station, which was the breakout movie for Ryan Coogler. And for those who don't remember, Fruitvale Station was a movie about the life of Oscar Grant um, a man who was killed in an act of, you know, police brutality by Bay Area Rapid Transit police officers. Supposedly, the officer thought that they had reached for their taser, but they actually reached for their gun. So 
that was the very first movie that put Ryan Coogler on the map. And by this point, because of Michael B. Jordan's willingness to star in that movie, Michael B. Jordan and Ryan Coogler were a great team. And that is what we are supposed to be seeing in this picture. But yet, we had some people who were just freaked out by it because you had two black men appearing to be affectionate. And it's sad. Because for men today, the only real emotion that we are allowed to show is anger. Anything else is seen as suspect. And when we think about that, you know, it should be no surprise why men have so many psychological issues. You know, we wonder why men try to master feelings with drugs, alcohol, or sex instead of processing them. And we wonder why so many men handle their problems with guns instead of using words. You know, the answer, because we're not allowed to show any kind of emotion other than anger. And, but that's why it is important for men to see in this passage that an all-powerful God publicly cried about the death of his male friend. No matter what people say, there is nothing wrong with men showing emotion. But see, but as bad as it is for men, it doesn't only impact men. For women in our society today, their crying is used to diminish their capabilities. Indeed, women's tears are used to perpetuate sexism. And for some people, who, those people like to suggest that women are too fragile to handle the complexities of our society, even though, truth be told, our society would have crumbled probably millennia ago without the presence and ingenuity of women. And then, even when we think about it for adults, it also affects children. Yes, it is true that children are allowed to cry without consequence, but even that has limits, you know, on it, depending on their age and gender. You know, like, little boys are told to man up, and that's even when they're very young. Like, I remember being out recently and saw, you know, a little boy crying because he fell and skinned his knee, and people were getting on him for crying. This little boy was young. But this happens a lot that, you know, Children, you know, it happens to both boys and girls. It happens to all children, really, but there is something to be said for boys being expected when they're not even in kindergarten to, like, man up. And as for girls, girls are allowed to cry a little bit longer, but eventually it's like people say, well, don't waste your time crying, do something, as if, you know, the tears don't have a purpose. But, Jesus being all-powerful and crying in this passage serves as a model for all of us. Our tears do not make us weak. Our tears do not make us incompetent. All our tears make us is human. And now that brings me to my final point. So the first point was relationships matter. The second point is showing emotion doesn't make us any less powerful. And my final point is this. Being powerful shouldn't make us any less compassionate. Again, being powerful shouldn't make us any less compassionate. Now, this is probably the part of this sermon that is most convicting for a lot of us, all right? Because Jesus was all-powerful, Jesus knew that he was going to resurrect Lazarus before he even started heading toward Bethany to see what happened. But Jesus was not cocky and arrogant about it when he reached Mary and Martha. See, some of us, when we reach, especially if when Martha approached us, some of us would have been quick to say, you know, calm down. I'm going to bring him back to life. Like, Mary, stop your crying. You know I'm going to bring him back to life. You know I can do that. And that's right. We would have been quick to chastise people in Mary and Martha's position for coming to us wondering why we were so slow getting there when we had the power to bring a completely different outcome. And... How do I know we would do that? Because truth be told, we as people do that to, uh, to each other now, and we do not even possess the level of power that Jesus possesses in this passage. See, as a minister, I've been to several funerals. It's a part of the job. And sometimes I hear preachers literally guilting grieving families for mourning. They'll say things like, well, your loved one has died, but they're with Jesus now. There's no more suffering, so you ought to get up on your feet and clap your hands. It's like but I'm sad that my loved one is gone. What do you mean by that? You know, 
And it's insensitive because even if we as believers believe in heaven, believe that there is a place where there's no more death, no more crying, no more suffering, that does not keep us from missing our loved ones here and now. But it's true. That happens. And people are often shamed for their natural grief. That's a part of why I make a point of praying for bereaved families all the time, because whether your loved one has been gone for like a day or a week or years or decades, there will still be times that come up where, you know, you miss them. You wish they were there. Something comes in your life. You pick up your phone and you want to call them, but you can't do it. You know, it still happens no matter how long that person has been gone. And so when I was asked to speak at some funerals, you know, because that's what kind of happens in ministry, even if you're not giving the eulogy, you might be asked to give some words of comfort to the family. Um, this verse became a verse I like to talk about because I say, well, you know, don't let anybody shame you for crying. If Jesus wept, you can wet, you can weep too. Um, but getting back to the point, even though we know this happens to us a lot, our power should not lead to a loss of compassion. And again, our power should not lead to a loss of our compassion. Our ability to make a difference shouldn't lead us to become distant and cold. That's why we have to be careful. See, I believe God has put many of us in a position to be a blessing to others. And if he hasn't done it yet, he's going to. Just hang tight. It'll happen. I believe that's part of what we as Pivot Point Gathering are called to do. But as the old superhero adage says, with great power comes great responsibility. And I believe part of the responsibility that comes with being able to bless others is to remain grounded and humble. And how Jesus acted in this situation is a great example of that. Here he is with all power in his hands, yet he's still connected enough to his friends and his environment to recognize their pain, even though he knows he's about to fix it. And in contrast, some of us will buy the most beat down of hoopties and be proud to drive past our friends in need of a ride at a bus stop. You get what I'm saying here. Some of us get a little bit of power, get a little bit of a change in our lives, get a little bit of influence, and forget to help those in our environment who are in need. Instead, we actually start to look down on them. But that's not what Jesus did here. He didn't make Mary and Martha's grief seem trivial just because he knew he had the power to bring their brother Lazarus back to life. He showed them compassion. He was patient with them. He wept with Mary when she wept. And in that same way, we cannot let our power, our breakthroughs, and our blessings keep us from being compassionate to those who we are in a position to help. So as we conclude this message, I just want to remind us of the following. Jesus wept so we can understand the value of our relationships. Jesus wept so we can understand that our emotions are not a weakness. And Jesus wept so we can understand that even when we have power, we still need to have compassion. But I want to bring up one additional thought here. And this is for people like me who maybe are not naturally the most emotional of people. Like I know people who know me pretty well talk about my stone face. Even, you know, last week when I put up the picture of First Lady and I, you know, from our wedding day and then from my cousin Matt's wedding a few, um, now a few months ago, you know, people were quick to say like, yeah, you had the same exact facial expression in both pictures. And they were saying it in a nice way, like we know that you're happy. We know this, we know that. And people who know you know that even when you smile, you don't have the biggest range of emotions. Like, okay, I get it. So if some of you have probably experienced the same things happening in your life where people tell you you're not the most emotional of people. So for you, you may be wondering, well, how do I fit in this sermon, right? This whole sermon, I personally have talked about the example that Jesus set by weeping publicly about the loss of his friend. But I still have one major caveat here, which is that that was how Jesus authentically expressed his grief. And I don't want anybody to walk away from this message thinking that there is something wrong with them if they are not naturally the most weepy person, if they're not the person who cries at the drop of a dime, you know? What I am saying in this passage is 
that there's nothing wrong with crying if that is your authentic expression of your grief. But we have to remember that God created all of us differently. You know, and I get this because I am somebody, and you've heard me talk about this, that I was criticized a lot, especially during my college years, for not being the most weepy of people during praise and worship, you know. That was a time when praise and worship was still a relatively new phenomenon. It's hard to believe I've been out of college for 18 years, undergrad, but I have been. And back then, you know, that's when a lot of churches were switching from choirs to praise and worship teams, and people were trying to understand the difference between praise and worship, you know, with worship being a time that we draw closer to God and, you know, tell God how important he is in our lives and how much we love him and things like that, Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about that, but for a lot of people, when the time of worship would come up, the tears would fall as they expressed how close they were to God. And if you were somebody whose tears didn't fall, like me, you know, you got criticized. So I couldn't let this message in without talking to those people among us who maybe are a little bit less emotional and maybe a bit less naturally expressive. If that's you, I still want to encourage you. There's nothing wrong with you. That's how God created you. Keep in mind that, yes, Mary's weeping was a part of what led Jesus to to weep. But Mary wasn't there by herself. Martha had already confronted Jesus. Yes, Martha was upset about the death of her brother, too. But Martha (laughs) confronted Jesus about it. She handled it differently. That doesn't mean that one handled things better than the other. It just means that, you know, for every Mary, there's a Martha. For every person who's visibly emotional and who will weep, there's the person who's visibly strong and holds things together, right? So yes, Mary is important, but Martha is important too. And if you are a Martha, and I know I've done this in a sermon before, but if you are a Martha, that's fine. God created you to be that way. What this message was really saying is that there are some among us who are afraid to show emotion to the point that they repress their emotion because they're concerned about being looked down on. And this message reminds us that Jesus, who is our model of everything, was open about his grief after Lazarus died to the point of being willing to show his grief on his face. Jesus remained compassionate and humble even though he knew he was going to bring Lazarus back to life. So I want to make that clear. Those of us who are a bit more emotional, there's no shame in that. If you feel like crying, cry. Those of us who are a little less emotional, there's no shame in that. Don't feel guilted into being something that you're not. But from this passage, I want us to remember this. Our relationships matter to God. Our compassion matters to God. And based on Jesus mirroring Mary, our tears do matter to God as well. Therefore, we have no reason not to be afraid to cry. So with that, um, I am going to reach out and get the tea that I meant to get earlier that um, First Lady brought to me while I was singing. So give me a second. And now we are going to open the doors of the church after I take some tea. So, um, this message was really all about um, how we should not be afraid to be vulnerable, you know, how we shouldn't be afraid to show emotion when we feel it. And we understand that based on Jesus and how he showed emotion in this passage. And, but now we're at the time of service where we offer the chance to get a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, because we understand here that the role Jesus played, when I say we are believers, what I mean is that we believe that Jesus died to take on the punishment that should have been ours for sin. See, when you go back to the very beginning, our earliest ancestors, Adam and Eve, were created to have fellowship with God and to walk with God. 
But when they ate the fruit from that tree um, of the knowledge of good and evil, when they ate that fruit, sin was released. And because of that, sin was punishable by death. But Jesus, well, God sent down his son, and actually we can say he came down in the form of his son, Jesus, um, to act as that mediator, that bridge, to help us to have the relationship that we were meant to have with God all along. So what we believe that Jesus came down and died for our sins and is currently in heaven with God, that makes it possible for us to have the relationship that God created us for from the very beginning. So if you would like to begin the journey as a believer, you know, and start your relationship with Jesus Christ now, I encourage you to um, repeat this prayer after me. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Again, if that is you, um, we um, would love to hear from you. So you can fill out a contact card, the link below. Um, you can also um, write it in the comments and we will reach out to you or you can direct message us. You'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon and we'll help you figure out your next steps as a believer, whether it is becoming a part of us here at Pivot Point Gathering or if we help you unite with another church that may be a little closer to where you are if you're not located in the Philadelphia area. But we just want you to reach out to us so we can help you. Or maybe you are somebody who already identifies as a believer but you're looking for a church that is not afraid to talk about social issues a church that um looks at this at social justice and sees it as a part of the gospel based on what jesus said in luke chapter 4. you know a church is not afraid to have difficult conversations you know if that is you we encourage you to also fill out a contact card we'd love to have you as a part of pivot point gathering and just that, you know, if you have a church that you like, but you still want to be a part of us in some way, we do have a category of associate membership for those people who love their church where they are, but want to be a part of our community. And although we like distinguish on paper, we don't distinguish based on how we treat people. We have a lot of associate members, a lot of people who want to support us, who like what we're doing, but who say, you know what? I have another church I'm a part of. And guess what? That is okay. We love you either way. So all that is to say, if you want to be a part of us here at Pivot Point Gathering and you don't especially want to leave the church where you are, that is fine. We love you and we'd love to hear from you either way. Or maybe you are somebody who um, is in need of prayer. As you've seen, we've had some people, if you're watching live, you know people have been sharing prayer requests all service. And so we do pray for our prayer requests that are shared during service. Um, or maybe if you want your prayer requests to remain private, you can fill those out on your contact card. You can also direct message them to us and you can respond to our Instagram or Facebook story. But we do believe in the power of prayer and we are thankful when you let us know that the things you've been having us pray for, God has moved. Or maybe you are somebody, lastly, who just wants more information about what we do. We are going to be um, formalizing our newsletter soon. But in the meantime, if you are on our email list, you get information about what we do here. So if that is you, we encourage you to fill out a contact card. We'd love to hear from you. But with that, I'm going to review the prayer requests that have come through and get ready to close. And I just want to thank you all for your kind words. Thanks, Sister Michiko your kind words about the message, you know, I appreciate that. I mean, one thing that does happen, as you all know, I say this to and every Sunday, I'm really preaching in the basement of my house to an iPad screen. So I don't know how things are being received. And it's actually a, difficult because in the African-American tradition, like we are used to Preaching being a moment that everybody participates in, you know, people clap, people talk back, people jump up, like, you know, we don't just listen to lectures, you know, if you're, if you're raised in a black church, we really, everybody participates, everybody has a role in that sermon, you know, the preacher may be the one who's delivering the word from God, but the congregation responds and it's, there's just like nothing like it. And it's something that I definitely miss, even if I'm not the most like 
vocal or preachers. I'm not the one that will yell and shout and jump and all those things. But, you know, there's just something for that atmosphere that I love and that I respect from growing up in it. Um, so it means a lot when we get comments back to let us know how this is impacting you. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to close out in prayer. But yeah, happy birthday, Uncle William. Again, I'm glad you had a chance to watch service. I didn't know if you want to be able to be on. And like I said, me and Sawyer will be by later. And um, now I'm going to close this out. But just a reminder also, next week we will have service, but it's not going to be live. So even if it says it's live, it's going to be pre-recorded. All right. It just means that um, there's still going to be a new message for you. We'll still keep track of your prayer requests. But at this point, detailing the service is not going to be as interactive as it usually is. All right. So with that, I'm going to close this out in prayer. But just that you know, um, I will, as I tend to keep my eyes open for this part of the prayer. I'm trying to also bring up our prayer requests because, yeah, that way you will see the other general things that we are praying for. And I'm going to put that in front of me so that um, I can see that during the, prayer, during the service as well, well, during the prayer as well. But as I said, I'm going to keep my eyes open for parts of the prayer so that if people submit prayer requests a little late, I will see them. But um, as I say every week at this point, it is sad that people can go through a whole week without hearing somebody say that they love them. So everybody under the sound of my voice, I love you. God loves you. And so do we as Pivot Point Gathering, you know, in paraphrasing what my father in the ministry, Reverend Hubert Barnes, would say. So that way, nobody can leave this service without hearing that they are loved. God loves you. I love you. We love you. So you're important to us. All right. So with that, I'm going to close us out in prayer. Okay. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We pray that you would just help us, those who may be struggling to show emotion, to understand that it is okay, that there is nothing that says we can't be a bit more emotional, and that being emotional doesn't mean we're weak. Being emotional doesn't mean we're unproductive. Being emotional doesn't mean we're easily distracted because we're following your example and your son, Jesus, you were still able to handle the task at hand while weeping about the death of your friend along with, her, you know, his sister. So we just pray that you would help us not to be afraid to show emotion, but to be okay with the authentic expression of our grief, whatever that may be. But right now, we just thank you for the privilege to come before you. We pray that you will continue to move in us, move in our hearts, and allow us to be more like you. We know that in our society today, Christians have a pretty bad rep just because of the way that some, some in our faith and some in our political system have used our faith in order to try to manipulate people. So just help us to be good examples of what a believer is in this society, of what a believer can be. Help us to be examples of your love and your patience and your kindness and your just helpfulness. You know, just help us to show that there is another side to our faith than the hateful judgmentalness that some louder members of our faith choose to misrepresent us as. Right now, we come before you on behalf of the prayer requests, those that we lift up every week as a ministry. We pray that you would help us as we search for our location. Give us the capacity to be what you've called for us to be. Help us as we strive to be a part of the solution for the violence in our streets. Help us to address the health disparities that exist within our community. Be with us as we search for, um, well, as we just seek out our government for ways to improve our infrastructure, especially in light of the impacts of climate change. Be with our bereaved families and just bring order and clarity 
to our political system in general. We know there are a lot of people there who are there for the wrong reasons, but we pray that you would root them out and replace them with those who actually care about you and care about serving your people. And we pray for Reverend David. We thank you that he should be coming home this week. And we thank you for keeping him safe um, with his military training. Um, right now, though, we pray for the prayer requests that were lifted up during service. We pray for Uncle William, Deaconess Julia, Reverend George, Evangelist Tyra, Reverend Simone, Miss Jeanette, and Miss Jerry Simpson. You know the needs in each of those cases, and we just pray that you would work on their behalf and give them a great testimony that they will come to know more about you and that they can share you with others. That people will look at their lives and be like, wow, how did they get that resolved? And we will know it was through you, through your divine intervention. And we also pray for Sister Victoria and her job situation, her health issues, and that you will help her as she looks for more opportunities to work in theater. We will also pray for the health of both Jordan and Sister Sylvia. We thank you that you know, you've been helping them to find the answers that they're looking for. We pray that they will get the answers they need and that the doctors will be able to help them um, and to create um, some sense of you know, a good treatment plan so they'll know there's a pathway forward, that all is not lost, that all is not hopeless. And we thank you also that Sister Sylvia knows she'll be moving into the house she's been praying about for so long. Um, and we also pray for um, Reverend Janita. You know the need. She is a friend of our ministry. And we just pray that you will continue to be with her with her health concerns. And also thank you for, I believe she celebrated a birthday recently. Um, and now we also pray about those prayer requests that will be shared through our contact cards, those that will be shared through our Facebook and Instagram stories, those that we will get through direct messages, and those that remain on people's hearts. Help all of us to know that we serve a God that can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Um, and we pray for traveling mercies for me and for First Lady and for Sawyer and for Mom Rhonda as we will be flying this week. We pray that you would have your way Keep us safe and allow us to enjoy the vacation that you are bringing us on. And we thank you that Star of Hope Women's Ministry, that you gave them traveling mercies to come back. And we pray that it was a great time for them as well. We thank you for Uncle William and his 81st birthday. And we just pray that you will continue to watch over him, that there will be many more, but that people will just know, well, that he will know how important he is to us, to our community. But now, as we leave this place, go back to our respective destinations, we pray that your angels would encamp round about us to keep us in all of our ways and that you would let your light shine through us so people come to know more about you as they interact with us. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. God willing, we will see you next week again. It'll be previously recorded. But we love you all. We pray that God will be with you this week. All right? Amen.